Hello, everyone, and welcome to Encompass Live. It, it um, is presented every Wednesday at 10 o'clock Central Time or Central Daylight Time or whatever one we're on now. And um, today we're going to be learning some things about Zoom and, and some other things too. But I would like to introduce Beth Cabish, who is the Director of Blended and Distance Learning as part of the Educational Service Unit Coordinating Council. So I'm going to mute my phone, my um, microphone, and turn it over to you. And if we get questions along the way, Beth, I'll um, try to find a good point to stop and ask you those questions. So go ahead. Perfect. Thank you, Sally. And yes, Sally had shared my position. I work for um, all of the Nebraska ESUs in terms of the coordinating council. And that's what we do is we coordinate statewide projects. So blended learning and distance learning are two of those statewide projects that I'm uh, in charge of. And within those, we use extensively Zoom and we promote virtual field trips via Zoom. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to share my slide deck with you and get into the presentation mode. So yeah, it's a wonderful world of uh, distance learning or virtual learning or just being able to connect virtually like we're doing today. If you do want to access this slide deck later on, there are a couple of videos in here and maybe some resources that you would want to access and have uh, links to later. So you could do that by going to this uh, URL shortener, bit.ly slash two capital D lowercase s capital J, lowercase i, six, and capital P. So yeah, it does matter between the capitals and the lowercase. But um, let's see, let's go. Let's go to the next slide here. Uh, again, Beth, and you can reach me at uh, bcubbish, which is my Twitter handle, or at anyblended, which is another Twitter, Twitter handle that I uh, access, as well as at any underscore v, VFT, which is where we share some of this virtual field trip content. But today we're gonna to talk about connecting to meetings and more, and how can you as librarians enrich your patron experience with a virtual field trip, which we often call VFT. So we'll get started. And again, you know, the world is a book and those who travel, who do not travel, read only one page. And this is this VFT opportunity or using Zoom provides us with some such great resources within our library to share with those patrons and just i'm so excited that you are that you asked to learn more or to be to have access to some of this information what you see here is a video we tried to uh, look at this video and the audio doesn't come through so i'm going to suggest that you grab this video later on for instance if you're wanting to share with your board or with some um, of your constituents about what a virtual field trip could look like. This is Ranger Alvis. He is at the Scotts Bluff Monument National Park in Scotts Bluff, and he's talking about what he does in a virtual field trip, primarily with a class uh, school age children, but it is very interesting. And I think that all of our patrons, no matter what age, would, be will, would have interest in what Alvis is sharing about what they have at their particular site uh, for the, the Scottsbluff um, National Park. So you can go ahead and access that later on. And um, what we have in Nebraska, and one of the things that I do for my work is try to keep this clearinghouse up to date of potential VFT opportunities. So nbis.esucc.org is a link to this clearinghouse and we'll talk about that in a, a little bit later but this is something that was commissioned by our distance learning organization to again to bring together all classes that are being taught virtually as well as these types of field trips so you see on this particular screenshot there's a tab for field trips and when you go to that site, that's where you will want to head to is that field trip tab. You do not have to have a login. 
you can just go and search through that tab for potential field trips. And all of these are primarily in Nebraska. There are some that are outside of Nebraska, but they have connections to Nebraska. So this is a, a link to museums, to uh, organizations, to national parks that would do a virtual field trip for you at your particular library within Nebraska. So when we're talking about this virtual piece, you most of you, my assumption is that you're connecting via a laptop, and that works great. And this is where we use primarily this Zoom application that I'm going to talk about um, in a number of these slides and kind of give you some tips on how to utilize Zoom. But some of our schools and some of our institutions may also have what we would call an endpoint cart, which is a large monitor. You'll see up here it would have a camera. That camera can do a uh, pan, you know, pan the audience, it can tilt up and down and it could zoom. So we call that uh, PTZ. And then here is what we would call the codec, or that is the device that makes the connection to other devices for this particular video and audio interaction. Those things, the monitor, the camera, and the codec are all part of the Zoom application. So you can do the same thing on a desktop application. Obviously, in a desktop application, it's a little more cost effective. These particular units could cost anywhere from five to 10 to $20,000. It just depends on the features. So for, in my opinion, thinking for a, a library, uh, an endpoint system might be a little beyond our means. And so we have a number of laptops or desktop that we could use um, this desktop application. And so that's what we try to promote. So in that desktop application, we use this Zoom, Zoom app. Now today we're using GoToMeeting. And GoToMeeting is very similar to Zoom. Zoom is what we use in the educational uh, you know, organization or platform. And it, we just we have access to a number of licenses that we can use across Nebraska. And this has been our selection for that desktop um, vi virtual or video conferencing application. And you can go get a Zoom account. It's free by going to www.zoom.us. You can get a free account. We, across the education, the K-12 education system, we do have what we would call pro accounts, which are subscription accounts. For a library, if you're wanting to do a connection for uh, 45 minutes or less, a free account will do, will have the necessary requirements for you. When you connect to one of the, um, for instance, the Scotts Bluff Zoo, they might have a pro account and that's all that you would need is for that particular institution to have a pro account if you wanted to access some of these um, other features. So when we talk about enrichment again, the Omaha Henry Dorley Zoo does wonderful types of activities that you could access for after school programs, for adult ed programs. Uh, we, we promote the zoo when they're talking about the science standards. Also, a number of our students go to the zoo for an actual field trip. And so they'll do a virtual type of field trip just to give that experience to say, when you're here on site, be sure to find this or to look more detailed into this particular animal, those kinds of things. But it also provides us with information about uh, animals in other environments, about, um, you know, obviously elephants and and uh, the forest that they have. Um, so anyway, the Henry Dorley Zoo does a wonderful has a wonderful opportunity for learning for all types of learners. Another one is the Durham Museum. So this particular session was on um, how the ra railroad impacted Nebraska when it was first, you know, created or built across the state and what happened with you know 
the coming of, of railroads and some of the, the background stories of maybe some railroad, you know, some robberies and, and all thanks types of things that you might hear. So that's just one program that the Durham uh, Museum has. And again, some of these would be very interesting, I think, to our adult learners as well as our, our uh, K-12 learners. But those are just two examples of what we can access by having a Zoom account with either, a, most commonly we're going to use a laptop, and to be able to search and connect with these uh, providers, these content providers. So here are some slides that might give you some details about features of what Zoom could do for you. When I connect from my home, and I'm not doing it today, I'm not in my home office, but my internet at home is not really strong enough to have both a video connection and an audio connection. So with Zoom, I can do a video connection with my laptop, but then I could have an audio connection with my phone. So with Zoom, when I connect, it'll give me a phone number and it'll give, it, it'll give me a meeting ID. So when I dial this phone number, there will be a robot voice that'll say, please enter your meeting ID, which I would do. And after I hit the pound key, it'll say, please enter your participant number, which I would enter in this case 13. What happens then is it syncs your audio with the video and no one really knows that you're even on the phone. So by using this phone op call option within Zoom, I can separate my audio and my video and my experience will tend to be a more uh, stronger connection and I won't get any my audio won't kind of go out or um, not be as strong. So that's one of the options. Again, that particular option is available whether you're doing a, a subscription or a free account. So some of the other things within Zoom that you might want to consider is um, just by giving a URL. So let's say that you want to connect to the zoo and you want to give them the URL, which is our our web address to connect with Zoom. And you would go into your account settings and here then is that URL for that particular Zoom account that I have. Again, I can go into my free account. I will get a specific or a unique URL for my account and this would be what it is. So I would share with, with the other institution or organization that I want to make this virtual meeting with the URL they can go to that same one and will connect. So it works pretty great. Uh, with a, a subscribed account or a, a pro account, you can also create a personalized account. So you'll see here that this is a personal link. It's the same exact as this digital one, but you can personalize. And this particular one is then zoom.us slash my slash network Nebraska. Um, always available with help screens. If you go to the Zoom website, there is a help screen that can take you and walk you through any of these features of Zoom that I'm talking about today. So, so it's always a great idea to think about that manual that we have for devices, and this would be what we would use for our Zoom account. So you go in, again, you go to our your um, your URL for uh, zoom.us, there's a help screen. Or you can, once you install and access your uh, Zoom account, once you create Zoom up here, then you can go into the help. You'll see in the drop down menu beside your name, this one's for Scott Jones, you go to the drop down and you can see help and you would get this screen. So, all of these things that I'm sharing with you today, you can review again in the help screen. Um, so, Zoom has raised hand. We have that in our GoTo meeting. You just as a as a participant, you click on the raised hand and then whoever the presenter is could see, it will pop up over here and say, hey, um, Beth Kubish has a question. And so then you can, as the presenter, you would recognize that one of your participants is a question. And so you can stop and ask that question. And it's kind of a nice feature when you have um, multiple people in your connection. 
what we use right now we're sharing the screen and we use that often and and that becomes a critical and a very helpful piece when you're connecting especially if you're trying to share some slides i know with a moral hall they have some presentations so they are sharing their screen so in the the zoom app there is a, a, a choice that says to share the screen. And you'll see here that whiteboard is an option, so you can annotate. Uh, there's, a, you can AirPlay if you have an Apple phone. You can AirPlay on this particular Apple device from your phone if you have a, a slide deck or some photos perhaps. But most often what you're going to do is you're just going to share your web browser and whatever you have on uh, that particular browser. For instance, that's what I was doing in GoToWebinar today, sharing that presentation. So those options are also available. What you, what this number four here is talking about on the bottom of the share screen. So I would want to share my computer sound and optimize it for full screen video clip. That works terrific when, for instance, when I, if I were to uh, share that video of Elvis from the Scotts Bluff Monument, I would wanna be sure to check those options and then that video would come through both the audio and it would be optimized so the algorithm for that video would be optimized so that you as a participant could see that and it wouldn't drag the video and the audio, it would keep them closer together. So within Zoom, there are features that allow for that optimization to show a video, even if you're in a video conference. So like nesting that video into my, my virtual or my video conference. Um, so again, to screen share, you just click on this uh, screen share and to stop it, then you click on stop share and, and then you're back at the video. So very simple, easy to use. Something that Zoom also has is when I'm looking at someone else's screen, so you see here, they are making, they are widening or making more narrow the screen share and then widening the gallery option. So here is a video of who's in my presentation and then this is what they're sharing for the screen. So within Zoom, I can make changes to that. It's a side-by-side -side mode and I can just, um, change the width of this. Sometimes it's nice to see the image of, of the participants um, alongside the, the sharing of the screen. So that's when I would use that particular feature. Um, also, Chromebooks, you can use Zoom within a Chromebook. It has uh, an extension. So previously, we were not able to use Zoom on Chromebooks because it was a downloaded app. Now they've created an app for Chromebooks or an extension app for Chromebooks. So, so that's really nice for, especially for some students uh, in our schools that would have Chromebooks. Breakout rooms are, is a feature, and this feature is only available on the pro or the subscription account, but you only need one person in your community of virtual uh, participants to have a pro account, they would share their URL or their, their um, personal meeting ID, and then you can access a breakout room. So a breakout room simply means that right now we are in a general room, and a breakout room would then divide us into however many subgroups we would want to have. So for instance, um, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. So here you see that there is the icon to start the breakout room. And again, the free account or the basic account does not allow you to do that. You have to have a pro or subscription account to start that. And it's in the settings in order to make that available. But once you decide that you want to create a breakout room, what will happen is it'll say, okay, so how many participants do you want in a breakout room? So do you want one breakout room? Do you want two, three, four? However many that you want based on the number of participants. And you can choose it manually or automatically. So what we do in most of the cases that I'm involved in is we manually select the breakout rooms. So we come together as a big team or meeting 
And then we have subgroups. So some of us are working on open education resources. I gave a Encompass Live uh, presentation a couple weeks ago on OER. And then some of us might be working on uh, distance learning or virtual field trips. So we want to divide ourselves into those two subgroups. And that's what we would use for a breakout room. So we would manually say, we want two breakout rooms. And then whoever is in charge of the breakout rooms would say, okay, so Beth is going to go with OER, BJ is going to go with virtual field trips, Molly will be with OER, and Scott will be with virtual field trips. So we're dividing ourselves within those breakout rooms. So now in a breakout room, we have our conversation just like what we're doing here, but we don't hear the other breakout room. I'm in OER, I don't hear what's happening happening in the VFT breakout room. We have our discussion for 15 minutes. Once we're done, we close up our breakout and then we're back together again within our whole group without having to drop off and dial back in. It, it works really great for those kinds of meetings and then when you want to break out into additional meetings. So that's a feature with the pro version. And again, you only need one person to have that available in order to access the pro, uh, excuse me, the, the breakout rooms. Um, again, that's just when you're done, then you wanna close all rooms and then you would come back to the entire room. So we talked about the URL for Zoom and what you can do is with, within Zoom, so when you, you load up the Zoom account and, and you run the application, you can invite others with a, um, and it's just a, a, a copy of an email that you could send. So that email usually is pretty generic and it tells the people, and you just send it as an email, it tells the people here, you are invited to, to Beth's Zoom room or Zoom meeting. It gives my URL, just like we talked about before, as well as it gives, if you needed to access it through a phone, it gives that phone number um, and all other different ways to get into or to access or to connect via Zoom. So a Zoom invite works, uh, you can just copy that and then send that via an email. Um, different layouts, uh, and, I, and I'm sure that, that uh, Go to meeting has different layouts, but within Zoom, it's very simple on how to change a layout. You come up here and it just allows you to go, this is a speaker view. So here we have these people um, are connected in this, this video conference meeting and the speaker right now, whoever is talking happens to be BJ. And so his image comes up larger than everyone else. So that's called speaker view, but we also have gallery view. And so this is all of the people that are included in that particular conference or meeting. And so here's BJ again. Right now, Beth, me, is highlighted. You can kind of see that green is around. So that simply means that I'm the one that's talking. And because it's in gallery view, it's not putting my face or my image large. It's got everyone equal size. Sometimes I use this particular view if we're just really having conversation back and forth and back and forth. But if someone is presenting, then I would normally go to the speaker view. Um, when I'm sharing my screen, so this particular situation or image is showing that I'm sharing a, a screen, so I'm sharing a document, but here I'm speaking, okay? So it has a little image of me as I'm speaking to my colleagues, but I'm sharing this document. So I don't have to see everyone, I'm sharing it, but yet they can still see my video. And just to let you know that in best practice for virtual connections, you always want to share your video. You, uh, over here, you'll notice that this particular person, Chris Good, she had a picture of herself, but she currently is not sharing her video unlike everyone else is sharing their video. And that is what we would consider best practice of interacting, especially if you are trying to get a point across when you, you're using your hand gestures, that makes a difference. And they just wanna see your face and see your image. So when you're in a, a 
a meeting or a video conference, you always want to share your video, even though we don't like to, <laughs> we still, according to our best practice, and I believe it's true too in my experiences, that we want to share a video. Um, some other pieces that you can do are pinning a, vi a video. So this would mean that if we're in speaker view and we don't want other people to pop up into that speaker view, we can pin it. And so that just keeps that video solid there. Um, we can also mute our microphones. And again, that would be considered a best practice. And so in this webinar today, your microphones are muted, but when you're in Zoom and, and you're all connecting, um, we can hear everything from your uh, connecting to the, or you're typing on the keys to what happens in my office if I'm not muted is, is they'll send a, a, a message on the phone system and everyone gets to hear that, which is not what you want. So it's always good practice to mute your audio, keep your video live, but to mute uh, until you want to present or share something and then you would unmute. Um, again, just some other options of what you can do for uh, equipment at your particular site. This particular piece is a, um, it's just a conference phone. Um, and it could be used. I, I have not used one of those before. However, we've used this particular, and remember I talked about point, or excuse me, pan, tilt, and zoom. So P2Z, PTZ, I can't even speak today. Uh, this particular camera is very, very nice. You'll see it, it costs about 600, not about, it costs around 600 and some dollars, but it is very nice. And so if you're going to do a lot of these and you have some, some dollars to make an investment, that is really a nice investment. And it just plugs in with a USB into your uh, computer system, which is also really great because then you're not counting on your computer uh, camera to catch the whole audience if you have a, a you know, if you're doing this with a, a number of people in your audience and you're, wanting the, end, the other end to see all of the audience, a separate camera is what would be recommended. So again, this particular one is just, uh, is um, great for high quality video. Here is a camera and microphone system all in one. This particular one runs a little over $300, 350. This particular price here was 369. And again, this is a, pan, tilt, and zoom. It has this little remote that sits on top of here, but it also has a, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to do that, also has a speaker built in. This particular system can run off of a Bluetooth. So if your uh, computer system has Bluetooth accessibility, you can run that camera and microphone via Bluetooth. And so you can move it within a certain range of your main computer. So that's nice. If you are then participating and you are a single participant, so we you, this would be something that you might want to consider if you're in a lot of meetings. So if you're connecting with your libraries around your um, system area via Zoom, then having a headphone uh, is uh, really a nice way to go because it reduces the audio, the noise from outside noises because you're using the headphone and the speaker that's attached is very high quality also. So this particular one runs a little over a hundred dollars. It is wireless and that's what I would totally suggest is a wireless headphone because then if you needed to get up and help someone you could but still hear the meeting uh, but you're just not tied down. So these are examples of what you could use at your library for additional equipment that could make your experience of using Zoom even better or more, uh, just a, a, a better quality experience. So I've been rattling on for quite some time, Sally. Has there been any kind of questions? We have not had any questions yet, but I'm fascinated by some of these things. I, I have a 
headset and microphone, but I'm connected with the wire. So I am very careful how I turn my chair. It's just me in my office. When I go to my meetings that use Zoom, um, I attend and we use the, the layout with all the people you can see at the same time. Sure. Mm -hmm. I have to be careful I don't run over my cord or get entangled that way or get it caught in my wheels. So yeah, I'm kind of liking the idea of uh, one without cords. <laughs> That'd be right. great. But even Sally, when you attend those meetings, uh, even though you're in your office, it is still my recommendation to have some kind of either headset or what I'm using today is just earbuds. I didn't, I'm not in my office, I'm in Lincoln, my office is in Columbus, and so I didn't bring my headset with me, but um, I still recommend a headset because, again, when I spoke about, you know, the phone system and they'll do an all call or even you're typing if you're taking some notes or somebody knocks on the door, whatever. I, I still recommend that if it's just you in your office that you still use some form of a headset. That's okay, well advice. let's, yeah, let's go on real quick. Let's see, what do we got? Okay, we're 30 minutes in, perfect. Yes. So I wanted to just, again, to share with you this Nebraska site. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that link and take you to our Invis, which N for Nebraska, V I S for um, R, and I don't know, it wasn't me that came up with the Invis, but we'll just say that um, this is our, our Nebraska site for, it's a clearinghouse for courses for K 12 students, but it's also, as you see here, a clearinghouse of field trips. So when you go to this site, nbis.esucc.org, then it asks you if you want to log in, but you don't have to log in. You can simply go to the field trip tab and it will give you the search screen. So here we're looking at 33 virtual field trips. I can scroll down, sorry if I'm making you ill, but um, these are the field trips that we have available in Nebraska. Um, I am trying to find the one for Alvis at Scott's Bluff National Park. So I'm gonna go back up and just do a little search here. So I typed in Scott's Bluff, oh darn it. Okay, I'm going to just search through my providers. And it is agate fossil bed. So I was looking at Scott's Bluff. That was incorrect. Mine, I apologize. So here is, remember the video at the beginning of my session today was with Alvis, the ranger at agate fossil beds. I said that incorrectly. He's not at the Scott's Bluff National Monument. So he's at, but this is out in Western Nebraska. Um, so you'll notice that this is for K-12, but this particular uh, clearinghouse is developed for K-12, but it doesn't mean that adult learners would not be able to access this kind of content. So what, um, what Agate Fossil Bed is, is a ranger there will introduce students to the, not the, the park or the monument and spend some time talking about diorama exhibits and the visitor center. Um, and uh, what you know what fossils or they they focus on bizarre animals that have roamed these prairies for 20 million years very interesting and but looking at fossils that were discovered near near this particular visitor center so here is a url or a link to that um, location or that particular monument and in order to register for this virtual field trip was just basically the fossil beds, then you would want to contact the program provider and you will see down here again that here is a link to the URL that would give you that program provider. If you want to use your ESU person, here is a link that would give you a list in your area. So for instance, you if you are in, um, uh, let's say that you are in Neely, 
your you are you, ESU person would be at ESU eight. And most of our schools and uh, I don't know about our public libraries, but I think they have an idea of our public librarians, what ESU you might be in. If you are questioning and you're not sure, uh, just reach out to me and I'll help you out and make a connection for you if, if you would feel more confident in that. So again, here is another description of this particular virtual field trip. It is 40 minutes long and it costs zero dollars. So all of our national parks and recreation um, uh, parks do not charge a fee to connect with them. If you are wanting to email Alvis personally, here is his email, and you could start that conversation about how would I uh, connect to Alvis. So um, that, uh, that list, from this invis is everything in Nebraska that we're currently aware of. There might be some that we're just not aware of. And if you know of some providers in Nebraska that are willing to do any of this kind of virtual field trip, please, please, please get in touch with me. And I will, uh, again, work with them to determine if we can, first of all, add them to this website. If you're wanting to reach out of Nebraska, and look at other content providers, then we normally would suggest going to CILC, which is the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. So I'm going to go to that link right now. <coughs> so this is a national, actually international, <laughs> website or clearinghouse for content providers also. And uh, this one, again, you don't have to have a login. If you want to be a provider, which I don't think our public libraries would be interested necessarily, but might, then you would have to create a login. But what we're looking for then is here is a virtual tour of the universe of Denver Museum Nature and Science. So it's about STEM and we could click on that. This particular program um, is 45 to maybe 30 minutes. Uh, actually, it's 45 minutes long, 30 minutes of a program and 15 minutes for question and answer. It is particular for grades three through eight. Again, don't let that um, you know, shy you away because what you will want to do is reach out to this content provider and say, we have some learners that are this range of of uh, learners and maybe you're looking for retired learners and just to share with them that they're interested about the nature and science museum and what they have and so you can make that interaction and they would provide a program for you but notice here that this particular program is delivered via zoom so what you have today are the knowledge and skills to access and to get Zoom ready for you at your particular site, and then you can reach out to a content provider such as, uh, such as the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and have a program for learners or for any of your patrons in your library, which I think is very exciting. Um, so CILC, Again, you can put, if you're looking for a particular program, maybe you're looking for a no-cost program, um, maybe you're looking for adult learner programs. And so you could enter in that search. And uh, so check out our free or discounted programs. So anyway, you can spend a lot of time searching on CILC for programs that might be appropriate for your particular learner uh, patron. Just to let you know, also, I did work with um, Tammy Barth at the Stanton Public Library, and they purchased a camera and microphone set for their particular library. They did go out to one of their nursing homes and connected to a content provider uh, but it was through the library, so the library was in charge of making that connection and did a virtual field trip for some of the, the uh, 
uh, guests or those that are currently residing in one of the um, adult or uh, nursing homes that is in Stanton. So I think this is a great opportunity to provide resources and interaction to all age uh, citizens of our communities. Uh, what Stanton had purchased was this particular Logitech camera, which uh, is not Bluetooth. The one that I showed you earlier is a Bluetooth, but it also does a USB connection, and that's what this does. It does have a point, tilt, and zoom. Um, you, you control it right here on top of the base, and then this is a speaker piece. This particular speaker, by the way, this is a just an extension, so it does work within, this is the same piece of equipment that this is. This extension piece comes with it, so it can be used either way. This works really great because it gets a little bit higher and then you can do your pan, tilt, and zoom. But um, this particular unit is around $300 too. So either of the Bluetooth or this one are about the same price, uh, but both are from Logitech. And, um, but I'd highly recommend getting a unit such as this or the long skinny one that was, that was a Bluetooth. It just is uh, a better quality, of video when you can do that, you know, away from the camera of your computer or laptop. So I've talked a little bit about meetings and these virtual field trips. Um, you know, what could you also do with Zoom? I have grandchildren, although they live very close to me, but you could even use Zoom just like you could with FaceTime. Um, Something that I, I did not show you on Zoom is you can record video. So let's say you're trying to build a promotional video that you want to display on your website. You could use Zoom and you're the only person that's in your Zoom connection and you can record your video within Zoom and then save it and upload it into Google or YouTube or wherever you want to upload it and then access you know, include that in your website. Um, it, it's very simple to do. You just hit record and you can do this with a free account. And when you're done creating your video, you stop it, renders the video and that's it, it's done. Uh, some teachers, you know, will say, oh my gosh, but yeah, I have to now go back into my video and edit it and take out some of the words or when I said something incorrectly, then I have to edit it. And my thought is, you know, when I'm speaking to you live, I can't rewind <laughs> and go back and edit any of that conversation. I know that a video, you would want it to be short and to the point and not have any of that ex excess, but uh, still that's you and that's how you, you speak normally. So many of our teachers will say, I don't go back and edit out any of my errors or any of uh, those things that maybe I wasn't so pleased or proud of. I just leave it in there because that's me. But uh, anyway, you can connect, as, a, as it says here on this slide, with meetings, maybe in your system, maybe with a colleague in another system or another library. You can bring in experts for some of your learners or your patrons, and you can record um, a video and post it on your website. So are there any other ideas that uh, you think you might think of to use for Zoom in your library? Any other thoughts? I think one thing I know some people have done is they've had author visits. Bringing an author physically to your library, that's kind of expensive, but there are a number of authors who will do a visit via Zoom or another um, system mm -hmm. like Go that to webinar. Yeah. for mm -hmm. like $100 or $50. It depends on who they are and how willing they are to give you a break. <laughs> Sometimes they're very yeah. nice. There right, have been a right. few who have done it for free, but I think that's going by the wayside now because it's mm -hmm. um, there's a, a lot of, de of requests, I guess I'll say, not demand. Um, but Well, um, but you know, you, it takes time to prepare. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different. And so you have to value their time and and then presenting 
you know, that's time out of their day too. So yeah, I think it makes sense that they might charge a nominal fee, although most cases it's a lot less than having them maybe fly into Nebraska or and drive to our libraries and so forth. But yes, it's great. So it's harder to get Any a other? book autographed, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> When they figure out how to do that over Zoom, then we're really... I know. <laughs> I know. That's great, Sally. Other questions that might be um, showing? I don't have any questions right now. I'm keeping an eye on the question screen from GoToWebinar, but uh -huh. um, I think people are absorbing a lot of information, so that's yeah. good. Okay. Well, I'm just going to share my last slide here. Present. Um, and here is my email, uh, bkabes at esucc.org. So if you want to reach out to me with any questions or um, a contact, you know, if you're looking for a contact to help you, our ESU people would be willing to help you, um, I believe, in most cases. So uh, I can help connect you with them. And um, otherwise, that is my presentation for today, Sally. Well, we have one question, and yeah. this will be hard to answer, I'm sure. So just warning you. What is your favorite thing about a virtual field trip? What is, what is it that really makes you happy about them? What makes me happy and my favorite thing about a virtual field trip is that I get to go visit a zoo or a some of the, the Cleveland Museum of Natural Arts and History is outstanding. They have a tremendous um, presenter, and so it it gets me engaged in what they're sharing. Um, we the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame previously was on there, and so you get and I'm I'm I love music. I love learning how to play instruments. I love singing and and so forth. So that was an outstanding one. It made me happy. It made me excited. You know, you're you're leaving the 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 virtual field trip, singing some songs, singing some rock and roll songs. So it's about learning and about expanding my just like a library, right? Just like an experience of going to a library to give me uh, opportunities to continue learning. So that's what I love. The most is uh, just seeing what the ghosts or rangers can share about their um, location and what they have specific and uh, you know it, it's just very very interesting what you might learn it's it's like reading a book yeah good point and I think that we're going to have a number of librarians going to that website and looking for programs that they might offer at their library like you said are also out in the community. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that was a great example of providing a program and service to people who may not necessarily get to the library all that often. Exactly, exactly. Right, right. So, and after school programs and summer, uh, summer reading programs, like you said, Sally, for summer reading, maybe you would bring in an author, but even for summer reading programs, maybe you're doing an activity around fossils or learning about you know some of the animals in your community and what may have that looked like you know a million years ago however many years ago so you might want to connect to the agate fossil bed and talk about what fossils were discovered there and and how that happens so i think these are great opportunities for all of our our library you know patrons and um, visitors that is great um, I really thank you for sharing your expertise and knowledge about both Zoom and um, virtual field trips and different places to go find some that people can sign up for and taking the time to give a presentation today and, and join us here at Encompass Live. So thank you very much, Beth. We really appreciate you sharing what you know. Thanks for the invitation. Always happy to uh, participate. That's great. And um, you may be getting some emails from some people that have more questions after they've thought about the program for a little bit. So just keep that in mind as well. <laughs> that would be great. I would love that. Yes. So I'd also like to thank the people who attended today 
and I hope that you have learned some things. And I know that a number of people will be viewing this um, Encompass Live as a uh, uh, after the fact because it is on our web page as an archive. So um, thank you again, everybody who attended, and thank you again, Beth. And now I'm going to end the program for all of us. So.